Good evening, everybody, and welcome to um, Flinders University. I'm Professor Fran Baum, and I'm Matthew Flinders Distinguished Professor of Public Health and Director at the Southgate Institute of Health Society and Equity, where our speaker tonight works. And I'll say a bit more about Anna in a moment. And I'm going to be your host for the evening. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging that we're meeting on the lands of the Ghana people and to pay respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Um, I also like to acknowledge their resilience through the processes of colonisation. I think that's pretty amazing. And to respect their cultural heritage, their beliefs, their relationship with the land and their language. And acknowledge that all of those have a strong continuing importance for the Ghana people today on, on this beautiful country that we've all got the privilege to meet on. Um, I have to do some uh, emergency exit advice. So um, it, where are the emergency exits? I didn't notice that. It doesn't have a thing, does it, actually? Catherine, where are the emergency exits? Over there, you go out the back. And then you have to wait in Victoria <laughs> Square. Yes, yeah, so... Um, and we, we turn left down the hallway, I think, of the, the thing we have to do. Well, this lecture, research lecture series, is entitled Brave. And I've been asked to say if you, any, how many people are going to tweet, but if you tweet, please hashtag Brave Research into your posts or tweets. Um, and th this notion of brave, I think, is about partly about the history of Flinders and I guess as a university, uh, in the past, we've had a strong mission to change lives, change the world. And also Flinders has had a strong commitment to social justice. And I'm sure many of you are aware of that, of how much that's part of the Flinders tradition. Um, and of course, the way that we do that is by extending knowledge, by addressing big social challenges, and by trying to change people's lives for the better. Um, we're very fond now of quoting the first Vice-Chancellor of Flinders University, Peter Carmel, who explained what he saw for Flinders when he started the university. That, that was back in 1966, I think. He said, we want to experiment and experiment bravely. So that's where the brave comes from, in case you're wondering about that. Um, and and this, this week, as I'm sure you will all know here, is Refugee Week, when... I guess, um, the, the challenges and the struggles that people who have been refugees have faced in their lives are kind of examined and um, puts a focus on, on, I guess, some of the difficulties that people face coming through that refugee experience. But tonight we're going to really, or Anna's going to look, and then the discussion will build on that, to look at how can positive resettlement outcomes and good health be the outcome for people who are new arrivals in Australia. And I think most of you know that the world, in our world today, there are more and more people who are having to flee conflict, violence, persecution, or human rights violations. And there are massive movements of populations for those reasons around the world. I mean, in Australia, the extent of the problem here of, um, has been minimised because of government policy. But when you think about the movements in Europe, they're absolutely massive. So Anna is going to talk about the research she's been doing over many years now. Um, her broad area of research is what we call the social determinants of health. In other words, how social and economic factors affect your health so greatly. But she's been building a, steadily building a research program on the health and well-being and the social determinants for people from a refugee and asylum-seeking background. So Anna is an associate professor who, as I said, works at the Southgate Institute for Health, Society and Equity. And our institute sits within the College of Medicine and Public Health at Flinders. Anna, though, is a social scientist. And as I say, um, her, her main work in the last few years has been on refugee health and well-being. And I guess, Anna, the important thing for me about Anna and for the research we do at the Southgate is that 
Yes, we do research, but we also try and engage with what's happening in the world and, and really looking at how we can make a difference. So I think the fact that Anna is also convener of the Migrant and Refugee Research Network and works with a whole range of partners, some of whom are going to join us for the discussion, um, you'll get a sense that, that this research is not just for the sake of doing research. It is about generating new knowledge, but it is certainly also about changing the world for the better. So please join me in welcoming Anna. Thanks very much, Fran. Is that working, the microphone? Yeah. Excellent. Thanks very much for all of you for coming tonight. Um, I'd like to start by also acknowledging uh, the Ghana people on whose land we meet tonight and um, pay respects to elders past, present and future. I am uh, really pleased to be here also in Re Refugee Week, as Fran uh, mentioned. Refugee Week offers an opportunity to really celebrate the courage, re resilience and contributions um, to Australian society that people from refugee and asylum-seeking backgrounds have made. I would like to acknowledge the journeys of so many who have been forcibly displaced from their homelands across the world, and in particular any people in the room tonight who have had refugee experiences. Tonight I'm here... Oh, that's right, clicker. <laughs> Maybe you have to point it back. This no. is working before. Should we just use the mouse? Sorry. Um, so tonight I'm here to talk about how the impact of the social determinants of health for people from refugee and asylum seeking backgrounds and how we might harness this knowledge to promote good resettlement and um, health outcomes for new arrivals. I just want to start by touching on, uh, I'm going to start by touching on definitions and some of the limitations of terminology. I'll then go on to talk about the social determinants of health and the relevance of these determinants to the resettlement process. Focusing on a number in more detail, describing some of my own as well as other research in the area. I'll finish with some thoughts for what this research might mean for promoting positive resettlement and health outcomes as we move over to the panellists, who have, all have a range of expertise in this space. So a refugee is defined as a person who has fled their country of origin and is unwilling or unable to return because of a well-founded fear of being persecuted because of their race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion. An asylum seeker is an individual who is seeking international protection but their claim has not yet been finalised. Throughout my talk tonight, for brevity, I will use these terms of refugee and also asylum seeker, using refugee mostly unless visa status is a key factor. However, I acknowledge that for many people who have had refugee experiences, these terms may only be one part of their identity, or they may feel that the term no longer applies to them now that they've resettled. I'll also be using the terms resettlement or settlement, which refers to the process of refugees relocating into a new country. In this conception, settlement, um, I see it as a two-way process where both refugees and the wider community work together. Can I have a few of the slides? <laughs> You're going to be my... Clicker, thanks, yeah, John. I'll be your clicker. Thank you. <laughs> oh, now you've got it working. Just that magic tech touch. Oh, yeah. He's got that magic tech touch. Thanks, John. Um, so the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, or the UNHCR, estimates, as Fran said, that there are currently an unprecedented number of refugees or asylum seekers in the world. Over 68 million forcibly displaced people, including 25 million refugees, and over 3 million asylum seekers. Over 44,000 people a day are forced to flee because of conflict or persecution. Over half of refugees come from three countries, South Sudan, Afghanistan and Syria. The vast majority of refugees are hosted by developing countries and a very small minority are subsequently resettled in countries such as Australia. In terms of resettlement in Australia, refugees make up a small proportion of the overall migration program. The number of refugees settled each year has varied over the last number of years, with a one-off extra 12,000 places for refugees from Syria announced in 2015. Overall, more than 170,000 refugees have been resettled in Australia over the last 10 years. 
Some people with refugee experiences have also come to Australia through other arms of the migration program, such as the skilled migration program, and John will likely talk about some of the needs of those groups later tonight. Tonight, I'm going to be talking about the resettlement of refugees in the community, not the over 1,300 people in held detention, a large number of whom have now spent many years incarcerated. The detention environment impedes all of the social determinants of health and the devastating impacts of immigration detention on health and wellbeing are very clear. Detention policies are an important public health issue and this deserves a separate lecture in its own right. Pre and post migration factors mean that refugees generally have worse health than other migrants in the general population, particularly in terms of mental health. For example, it's estimated that refugees resettled in Western countries are around 10 times more likely to have post-traumatic stress disorder than age-matched populations in those countries. But tonight I'm going to be looking at some of the factors that support health for refugees. I'll be talking about health as outlined by the World Health Organisation as, as a complete physical, mental and social wellbeing rather than just looking in absence of illness or disease. The social determinants of health are, con are the conditions in which people born, grow, are born, grow, live, work and age, things like housing, Fran mentioned before, the broader social and economic conditions that we live in. The World Health Organisation highlights that these circumstances are shaped by the distribution of money, power and resources at global, national and local levels, and that social determinants are mostly responsible for causing health inequities. So they're really important. The rainbow figure here shows the factors that can affect health at a range of levels and the role of social determinants. So moving from the inside out, for refugees, this can range from individual factors such as visa status or educational attainment, social inclusion at a social or community level, living and working conditions such as housing and employment and healthcare services, and at the broadest societal level, general socioeconomic, cultural and environmental conditions such as immigration or labour policies. Newly arrived refugees and asylum seekers in Australia receive a range of settlement support services depending on their visa. And there are nine key, key areas of focus for this support. You'll see from this list that many are also social determinants of health. So when we provide optimal resettlement support, better health is likely to follow. Over the next few slides, I'll be considering the evidence in relation to a number of these social determinants of health in more detail. For refugees and asylum seekers, a sense of security is a critical issue. The diagram on this page is a common model used to depict factors important for resettlement. And you can see that rights and pathways to citizenship are conceived as a foundation upon which all else builds. This foundation can be difficult to get in place for refugees, and for asylum seekers, the visa determination process can be very lengthy, leaving people in a state of limbo for some time. Even for those who are subsequently determined to be refugees, some live in long-term insecurity. For those of you who are not aware, a range of policies enacted a few years ago restricts some refugees to temporary visas, potentially indefinitely. For these individuals, there are also restrictions on family reunion and entitlements such as education and resettlement support. In our Belonging Begins at Home study of over 400 refugees and asylum seekers in Adelaide, we found that those on temporary refugee or asylum seekers visas had worse resettlement and health outcomes. For example, they reported higher rates of discrimination, almost half the employment rate, greater financial difficulties and less overall sediment satisfaction compared to those on permanent visas, as well as lower mental health. As one participant said, as an asylum seeker, I have no rights in this country and live in a dilemma. In this way, insecurity undermines resettlement and health. In contrast, a sense of security, equitable rights and pathways to citizenship pave the way to better outcomes. Housing is an important determinant of health, with research consistently linking housing to both mental and physical health. Pathways identified include physical housing conditions such as mould and damp affecting respiratory health, and poor housing conditions or difficulty securing housing leaving people feeling anxious and unsafe, which affects mental health. For new arrivals, finding a house is a crucial first step to building their lives in Australia and taking part in a local neighbourhood community. However, in our Belonging Begins at Home study, we found a range of housing issues related to securing appropriate housing, as well as ongoing difficulties in housing. <laughs> These included unaffordable cost, large, fa large family size, unable to be accommodated in standard housing stock, limited social housing, difficulties competing in the private rental market, particularly in terms of lack of ref referees and discrimination and a sense of a lack of safety. Housing was also related to health for participants. 
Those who were living in housing that they were happy with, that had few or no problems, had better mental and physical health. We identified key factors that are supportive of health, and these include affordability, so that households are not in housing stress and able to cover other living costs, and safety, which is particularly crucial for refugees. Good housing conditions are also important, and secure tenancies allow people to put down roots in a community, as does being close to social networks and getting along well with neighbours. We also work with a small group of refugees and asylum seekers to make short films about their housing experiences. And another key element of housing that was highlighted in this process was the role of housing in providing a sense of home and place. In our full report, we outlined an extensive list of strategies to support health promoting housing. These included the need for broader efforts to address housing affordability, which is a broad national issue, investment in public and community housing, broadening entitlements for support to all refugees and asylum seekers, who often have fewer entitlements and raising new start. The enforcement of minimum housing standards, longer term support for people to find and maintain housing, assistance into home ownership, and there were some communities that were really finding success in this, and attention to safety in the placement of new arrivals. Employment is another key determinant of health. Employment can affect mental and physical health directly, for example, through stressful working conditions or exposure to injury hazards and also indirectly in the way that employment is a gateway to resources important for health, such as income, social networks and identity, where unemployment can undermine these. Referees, re refugees arrive in Australia with a wealth of skills and experience and a desire to find employment as part of establishing a new life here. However, they can face a range of barriers in securing work within the Australian labour market. For example, a longitudinal study of almost 2,400 refugees on permanent visas in Australia found three to six months after arrival, only 6% of participants aged 18 to 64 were in paid employment, rising to 16% around a year later and 23 around two years later, with rates for women much lower. Whilst this showed improving employment rates over time, it was still relatively low, and for those who did find work, most were in low-skilled occupations and not usually in their chosen profession. We're currently conducting a research project on these pathways focusing particularly on women and preliminary findings from this and other research have highlighted a range of factors making finding work more difficult or increasing exposure to hazardous employment. These include difficulties in having prior qualifications and skills recognised, limited English language skills, restricted education opportunities, a lack of local experience and absence of social networks to find out about opportunities, <coughs> discrimination and exploitation, caring responsibilities and also prohibitive visa conditions where some people may have no work rights or short-term visas that can make them less attractive to employers. Health issues can also make securing employment difficult. Once in employment, there can be risks to health also through exploitation and poor working conditions. For example, our recent study of refugees on temporary visas found exposure to exploitation and discrimination in the workplace, which had negative impact on mental health in particular. None of the participants felt comfortable complaining about their treatment due to a sense of powerlessness and a fear of it affecting their visa determination. One participant recounted a friend who wanted to complain about exploitation in his job. He said, because he's got a bridging visa, the company or the owners of the company are 100% confident that that person's going to be in trouble because of the type of visa he's got, and eventually he'll need to pull out from the, com the complaint because he doesn't want to end up in detention. Low levels of employment can mean high levels of poverty for some groups of refugees, in particular those on temporary visas. For example, our Belonging Begins at Home study found that only 8% of asylum seekers and 38% of refugees felt comfortable with their financial situation. And 15% of refugees and over half of our asylum seeker participants reported a time in the last 12 months in Australia where they could not afford sufficient food. This study was done prior to the suspension of the Centrelink payments or st status resolution support service payments for some asylum seekers, which had included a small amount of income support for rent and food, subsidised medication and torture and trauma counselling. Service providers around the country reported a spike in calls for assistance and pointed to the serious financial vulnerability of these groups. Research we undertook with people who had had their support cut off found significant impacts to health as a result of financial difficulty. Research shows some key ways to improve refugee experiences in securing employment that is health promoting. These include the need for an overall refugee employment strategy to address some of the barriers at a structural level. 
Refugees are nearly twice as likely to be entrepreneurs as others in Australia. So greater support for refugees and small business and entrepreneurship would help further support this pathway to economic <coughs> independence. Early access, access to early English language acquisition through increased hours and broader eligibility for all type, visa types would also help. Improved accreditation processes and broader access to educational opportunities is also important. For example, those currently on temporary refugee visas face barriers to, temp to tertiary education. Dedicated employment support programs, including with el eligibility for asylum seekers, are also important. And there are a number of organisations here in Adelaide currently running employment programs. Working with supportive employers is also crucial. For example, the Brotherhood of St Lawrence in Melbourne worked with the ANZ and other employers to place over 500 asylum seekers in employment. For every $1 spent on the program, the economic return to employees and the government was over $3. Regional resettlement programs may offer benefits in securing employment also, but our own research in Mount Gambier with Congolese and Burmese refugees shows a need to match skills and qualifications with available jobs and the role of other resettlement factors in supporting employment. We also need safe avenues for redress where problems do occur and a need for, a safe, for an adequate and equitable safety net for people who are unable to find employment. <coughs> Discrimination is a well-known social determinant of health consistently linked to poorer mental and physical health outcomes. In our Belonging Begins at Home study, we found that more than one in five of our survey participants and over half of our interviewees reported experiencing discrimination on the basis of skin colour, ethnic origin or religion, with more also reporting witnessing the discrimination experiences of others. Discrimination happened across a range of settings and spanned insults and threats through physical assault and denial of essential services such as housing or employment. Experiencing discrimination was associated with less general trust, belonging and hope, which research has, ind has indicated a link to health. And discrimination was also directly associated with, worth me with worse mental health. Some of these impacts can be long lasting, as one young woman in our study recounted about the discrimination she had experienced at school. It impacts me in a lot of ways because people make me feel like I'm worthless and things like that, build up my depression. It still affects me in other ways as well. You still have flashbacks, you still remember those days. Other researchers likewise found that discrimination negatively impacts on resettlement and health. So it is a key resettlement issue. In terms of other indicators of social inclusion, in our own and other research, very high rates of civic participation and volunteering have been found in people from refugee backgrounds with a significant culture of giving back. For example, over half our Belonging Begins at Home study participants had volunteered in the last year, with many regularly spending time to support other ref refugees as well as more general volunteering in communities. There are also a large number of very active community leaders and the importance of these leaders in highlighting community needs and solutions that are informed by lived experience is clear. Later tonight we'll be hearing from Arifa, a young uh, community leader, about the experiences in her community <clears throat> and her efforts to make these voices heard. Engagement in broader social and community activities is also supportive of health. With high rates of community group, we find high rates of community group involvement, with over 80% of the participants in our Belonging Begins at Home study involved in a community group. These groups were broad, including sporting, religious and social groups. While there should be no sense of obligation, our own research as well as other studies suggest that civic and social participation can be beneficial for health, and for new arrivals it can be particularly good in building social connections and a sense of belonging as well as employment opportunities and self-determination. Later, later tonight we'll be talking about how community <coughs> sporting involvement can play a powerful role in promoting wellbeing for refugee young people. <coughs> Health services play an important role in treating ill health when it does occur, but they also can play a key preventative role, and Clemmie will be talking later about the evidence in this regard. For refugees, accessing appropriate health services is an important part of the resettlement process and also health promotion. However, our own and other research has identified significant barriers for refugees in accessing health services. These include cost language barriers, health and health literacy issues, um, transport, a lack of culturally appropriate services and visa conditions where some temporary visas restrict service access. Our recent study with service providers also highlights that trauma itself can make it harder to access health services. Health service access also includes oral health services. However, many refugees experience poor oral health and additional barriers to, health, to service access. For example, in our recent oral health study of over 200 refugees and asylum seekers from the Middle East, we found that despite 59% of our participants reporting needing fillings due to dental decay and 90% feeling they needed to visit the dentist for at least one reason, 
Over 20% had never been to the dentist in their lifetime and over 80% said they had trouble paying dental costs. There are a range of elements that would support health service access and the extent to which health services can promote health. The state currently doesn't have a refugee or migrant health plan and this is needed to ensure service coordination and access issues are systematically addressed. Our dedicated health services such as the Refugee Health Service, formerly the Migrant Health Service, and the Survivors of Torture and Trauma Assistance and Rehabilitation <coughs> Service, or STARS, play a crucial role in providing trauma-informed and culturally safe care as well as addressing the broader social determinants of health. We'll be hearing Rob from Robin, Director of STARS, later tonight about the innovative work they're doing. These services need ongoing, secure funding, but the broader health system also needs to be upskilled in this. A current primary health network project here in Adelaide working with STARS and the Australian Refugee Association is seeking to contribute to this, but more funding is required in this area for this to be done. Other factors are the broadening of free interpreting services to allied health and dental health service providers who are currently not eligible, an extension of access to health services for all humanitarian visa types, and clear pathways for people to navigate services. For new arrivals, a range of factors need to be in place for successful resettlement, and these resettlement factors are also important social determinants of health. And I've touched on a number of these tonight, and there are others also. Getting resettlement right not only makes a smoother process for new arrivals, but is also protective health of health in the short and long term for a population who already face higher risk of ill health. For receiving communities in the two-way process of resettlement, providing a welcoming, supportive environment is good for everyone. There is significant strength, resilience and innovation within communities and also within service provision. And you'll hear about this, more about this shortly from our panel members. But the social determinants of health also reflect broader structural factors, that, that outer layer of the rainbow diagram. These factors relate to policy elements that require government action and advocacy from the community. For example, to transfer those on temporary visas to permanent protection and the need for supportive housing, employment, health and welfare policies. All these layers need to be in place to provide a truly safe haven for those fleeing persecution, trauma and war, and an opportunity to flourish in a new life here, to settle well. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Anna. That was perfect timing. It was, it was fantastic. So we're now going to not have specific questions to Anna, but we're going to have a panel discussion. And I'm going to ask each of the panellists to come up in turn to start with Arifa Hassani. Would you like to come first? So please welcome the panellists as they come. Thank you, Arifa. Uh, John Khatib. John. Naida Ibrahim. Thank you. Robin Smythe, Smith, did you say Smythe or Smythe, yeah. And Clements Jew, so there we go. A lot of refugee families already live in very disrupted homes. They don't have all of their families with them. They're already struggling a lot because of that. And then there's a lot of financial stress because almost every single family will be supporting a few people overseas as well. So that's a huge issue. And then you come into the family, mom and dad, neither of them speak English, neither of them can do much work that requires any kind of language skills. So what happens is a lot of migrants and a lot of refugees will end up settling in a country town, which is where I started off. So when I first came, dad was like, hey, we're driving two hours out of Adelaide in a small country town where he all he could do was pick oranges. And so I ended up in a very, very small, very, I guess, not culturally diverse town. And I was the first student in that school, basically, that didn't speak English. That, and, I, and I remember at the time I was wearing a headscarf. So like I walked into school and I was an absolute alien to everybody there, to the staff, to the students. And for the six years that I was there, I was completely socially isolated. I was lost because I was a teenager and I was already, you know, having an identity crisis and then I end up in a small country town in Australia so now I'm like what do I even do with my life and because my parents neither of them speak English they don't they've never even been to school they have no idea what to do with me because they have no idea what I'm dealing with when I get out of the house so straight away I just was extremely isolated and I it was a dark spiral and I ended up having deep deep depression and it was very hard for me to get out of that so and and it's really every time and I stress this because it's really depressing when you see the government try to implement policies that 
strategically wants to put people in very isolated places. Thank you very much, Arifa, for sharing that. that. That really, I think, gives us what this resettlement experience can be like. So I'll come back to you in a little bit. And I might now go on to John. So, John, you're called a settlement coach. Sounds like a lifestyle coach or something. I don't know what that is. But can you tell us kind of what you do and what issues you see when you're, when you're working with people and trying to give them support? Thank you, Fran. Um, just briefly, uh, some background, where I come from and why I'm yeah. here today. Um, so I'm basically from Syria, originally from Syria a skilled migrant to Australia in 2013. So I arrived to Australia in 2013 as a skilled migrant. I've been through the settlement um, stages, name it, all the challenges that Anna mentioned and more, because my visa was a temporary one, a provisional visa, which is 489. So even, even though I was a skilled migrant, not a refugee, but I, I wasn't entitled to any services, any mainstream services, not even healthcare, Medicare, Centrelink, nothing. So basically, we define 489 as a student with a work rights. So you can imagine someone fleeing a country, a war zone with a family, two young girls trying to settle in a new country like Australia with, uh, with all the challenges. Settlement coach is basically uh, works around this uh, the, set, the nine areas in the settlement framework according to the Australian settlement framework. We are specialized in English RSA in employment education and English literacy. Um, so what we do, we work with individuals and groups so we can address their settlement needs. It's very basic when you say it, it's very simple when you say it, but it's really complicated from inside. Settlement itself is a wicked problem. You, everyone, we try to define settlement, but we, 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 we kind of, stakeholders have different definition of, uh, of the word settlement and when do you dis decide if this person is settled, actually settled or not. We try to tickle, we try to touch these areas and solve the problems of employment, education and English literacy in, in a different way through uh, individual work, um, uh, group workshops. Um, so what would you run group workshops in? For, uh, for group workshops, we have job readiness workshops yeah. like resume writing, cover letter writing, uh, interview skills, uh, job search online. And we find these workshops, these four workshops are very essential as a foundation skills for refugees because they actually don't understand the system. Yeah. Like, they want to search for a job and they reflect on their own experiences back home. So when they want to find a job back home, they simply make a connection, make a phone call. Mm. And they say, hello, person, um, person X, uh, son of uh, Y. Can you find me a job? I'll quit school and come and learn whatever. That's another model of apprenticeship mm. and, and entrepreneurship um, from, from a different perspective. But in Australia, it's quite different. There is a system, there is a process, there is a complicated process. Even for those who come from an engineering background, like myself, it's really complicated. Mm -hmm. Like you have to follow certain rules, develop certain templates for your resume, your cover letter, use certain types, uh, type of words, don't make mistakes, Mr. doesn't come with the dot after MR. It's, uh, there's so many tricks that we basically don't, don't realize. And these tiny little things, will demolish all the effort, all their effort to find a job. Mm. What is traineeship? What is uh, a friendship? What is, what are we talking about? So we we meet people who actually have absolutely no idea how to find a job. Mm. So they quit school, they stop learning English, mm. uh, and they start looking for a job. And the first question would be, how would you find a job if you can't speak English? Uh, if, you, if you truly sit with that person, um, and uh, try to explain the system, they will make some steps forward. They will try to make some, some differences. Some, um, they will try to learn, they will try to adapt and, and participate. But without this comprehensive understanding in our system, um, these challenges are going to stay there and, and basically needs to be solved. Okay, that's fantastic. So mm -hmm. thanks for that, John. Thanks, Frank. I'm now going to go to Nada. Nada, um, And I think you're going to talk to us about your community organisation, One Culture Football, which I guess is about the other side of life, not having a job, but having, you know, 
good things to do and how they can help people integrate and settle in a community. So t tell us Thank a bit you. about your work. Um, one Culture Football is a um, non-for-profit charity um, organisation um, started two years ago um, on the back of a um, football programme that we started for um, new arrivals and refugees, um, asylum seekers, whatever you want to name it, people just coming new to the country. Um, and mainly was for the youth. Um, sport is a very, very big thing. Um, we just play on the street, you just get down, call your mates, call your cousins, just get down and play, put a couple of shoes on the left and on the right, that's your goal, and then you play on the Not street, block. <laughs> you know what I mean, neighbours yelling at you and stuff, this is my right, don't take it away, you know, so you come to Australia and this is your more simple thing that you could do, you just... And presumably it's proper football, not Aussie rules. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Please a round of applause for that. <laughs> Appreciate that. Yes. Tell I come from that the round team, one. Actually. Yes, yes. No, no, no. Not for the, no. no. Um, so um, in my previous job, um, I was um, running all of these activities and similarly like workshops and stuff like this. I would have people coming um, in every workshop that I do but once I say it's sports day I'm struggling to keep up with the numbers everybody's happy to come and participate young and old everybody happy to come and play um, it was a very very successful program um, for my previous um, organization that I was at um, it wasn't there it wasn't a sporting organization it wasn't the line for them to be able to cater for more because there was a big need for it therefore myself and my um, colleague, the co-founder, um, who's not here today, we decided we want to do something for the community. So everything was pointing us at leaving our jobs, both of us, and starting a new organization. And it was a massive risk. And um, it was a beautiful risk um, because I was very happy to take it. He was very happy to take it. We created One Culture Football. We registered it, started using our connections, and then we started inviting the people that we know we started going to schools such as Adelaide Secondary School of English, Stepperton Senior College or um, in the north as well. We started one program in the city and then after that we went north, we went northeast, we went here and there. And then we started another side of it which is running um, football for people with disabilities as well. But coming back to the main topic here, um, I would like for you to imagine Arifa's brother finally arriving to Australia, hopefully, yeah. or, um, or another young person finally arriving to Australia, but they're going to face all of these struggles that everybody faces. And then he might ask, what about sport? I would just want to go and play mm. sport. Okay, where do I go? Just go to, where do you live? I live in the north. All right, go to Perfect Gardens or Salisbury or something. And then I go there. Yes, fees are $600. And you have to be here at six o'clock on time. And then you have to leave that. And then you have to do this and you have to do that. And then the coach is yelling at you. And they, you know what I mean? It's just like, no, this is not the sport that I want. And this is not, I shouldn't be paying money to, um, to participate because I actually don't have the money. You know what I mean? And this is like the biggest problem. A lot of people don't have the finances for it. Plus, this could have been... Um, Coming to Australia um, with what John was saying, like there is a system for everything, which considering to some of these kids might have come from, they might have just lived all of their life in refugee camps. Oh, and yeah. there is not much restrictions around the time and all of the rules and stuff. And then you just go into a club and then somebody is yelling at you like a coach. I'm not saying anything bad about a coach, but this is what I'm expecting from you. You're my player. You're going to be here, you're going to pass there, you're going to come on time, you're going to leave, you're in the change room, you're going to look here, you know what I mean? All of this which is a right for a coach, but the coach does not know the background of the person coming. This person will decide, you know what, even sports, stuff it. I'm not going anymore. That's when one culture football comes, mm. a safety net. Just come as if it's a street football. But there are people there to organise it, to facilitate it, to look after you, to talk to you, to make connections with you, help you make connection with others of mm. your peers, make connections with other similar cases come from different backgrounds and countries and different even continents, and then connect to the wider community. And once you're ready and you love it and you're really committed and you want to go for a club, 
we will refer you to a club. To club. We will right. take you through the right way. So this is so basically do people successfully go through your program and hundred percent Parafield Gardens Football Club. Hundred. Um, I would be very proud to say that the latest one had actually joined Adelaide United Youth Team. Oh right. Okay. There you go. Okay. So it's it is really it is really working very well and. The bottom line is, if they just come for the couple of hours and enjoy themselves with no restrictions, just like feel free and run and yep. play and um, go home happy, yep. this is more than enough. This is massive success. Considering all of these, it's like bring every single problem you know, put it in a blender, blend them together, give it to him to drink in the morning and then take him out to play sport. You know what I mean? This is the only so time they can get to. Do you have girls though? I do have girls Ooh, as well, nice yes. Um, we find it. how well the women's football team, Australian um, football team. They're doing very well. They're playing tonight uh, yes. or tomorrow morning, 5.30. Please be up yeah. and support the Matildas. Um, <laughs> Um, they We've hopefully going to win. Gonna win. Five nil or something. Not really, not really. No, no. We have we have more than sixty percent chance. They yeah. just need to do the job. They just need to okay. win today, <laughs> okay. and hopefully we'll be in the uh, uh, in right. the next phase. Well, look, thanks for that, Nada. Thank That's you. Fantastic. Cheers. And I'm now I'm now going to move to uh, Robin, and Robin is director of an organisation that's been around in South Australia for, for quite some time, the Survivors of Torture, Trauma, Assistance and Rehabilitation Service, otherwise known as STAR, which is much easier. So do you want to tell us a bit about how you see the resettlement from the point of view of the work you do with STARS? Um, so in terms of STARS, we see about 1,200 people a year and um, we say they're from refugee or refugee-like backgrounds because, as you've heard, it doesn't matter what yes. visa you come on. It matters the types of experiences people have had before they arrive in Australia. Um, you can imagine that if people have experienced torture or war-related trauma, there's a whole lot of things that stay with us after that. So it, often people will be in a survival mode until they get here and then people <laughs> might arrive in Australia and there's all these expectations about learning about school and finding a house and doing all of those things, getting a job. But sometimes it's only once you actually reach somewhere that's safety that you can start to process some of the things that happened in the past. So people might find that there's intrusive memories coming from things that happened in the past or difficulty sleeping, nightmares, having difficulty concentrating in class. If you can imagine trying to learn another language, if you haven't slept the night before, if your memory is full of things that have happened in the past, how you anchor the language and learn that. Um, there's also, as you heard before, it's very rare for whole intact families to arrive here. So people will often be experiencing um, some quite complicated grief. Some family members may be missing or they may not know where they are. Um, or even if you do know where your family are, people have obligations to family who are back overseas in really precarious situations. They might be getting phone calls in the middle of the night. They'll often go without their own needs here to send money back to families at home. Um, and in that, all that context, they're trying to navigate all of those other things that were talked about before. Um, we also find that people may have um, physical health problems. So um, we saw the very large number of people from refugee backgrounds on that slide before and it's less than one percent that get resettled in any year so the average length of stay in a refugee camp is more than 20 years so some people may have come really quickly from a war scenario we have you know people who've arrived from Syria who came very quickly from war to here there's other people that we have arriving who've had 20 years in a refugee camp we've seen people who fled their country went to a refugee camp, got married, had children. Their children got married before they came to Australia. Um, so there's all of that is complicating it. And in a lot of those situations before people arrive, they might not have had access to good health care. You heard about the dental hygiene. Mm -hmm. But often there's a whole lot of physical health issues that people have had as well and not been able to address. And then you arrive in Australia, you've got a health system that you've got no idea how it works. It doesn't look anything like the system that you're familiar with at home. When people go to the GP, the GP might might get an interpreter or they might not, but then trying to understand the information that's given, it's all very, very complicated. Mm. Um, so um, the rainbow of the different spectrums of things that Anna talked about before, um, in our work at STARS we try to address things from a whole range of different approaches. So we'll have individual counselling for people. Um, we'll have some group programs. We try the social connection, social isolation. Um, there we have programs around mental health. We also have programs around physical health, so complementary therapy programs like massage or the Bhutanese community. When we ask them 
you know, what is the biggest issue affecting you? A lot of them went through torture centres together and they have ongoing pain and they said yoga is something that's familiar in our culture. So we started a community program around that. There's a whole range of different ways. That's great. Yeah, thank you very much, Robin. And just before, so get your questions ready. We're we just going to hear from Clemmy, and then we'll throw. I'll ask <coughs> questions from the audience. So, Clemmy, you work in the Department of Psychology at Adelaide University. Clemmy used to work at the Southgate Institute, so I'm very <laughs> pleased to say that. And you're interested in sort of strengths-based approaches, not you know focusing on the negative in people's lives. So, what, what can you tell us a bit about what a strengths-based approach would be for people resettling from a refugee background? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Fran. So I think probably Robin and Nada have both uh, talked about strengths-based approaches already, uh, really, in that they are approaches which look at um, the strengths and the skills, uh, resilience, capacity, potential, um, the knowledge that people bring with them in relation to their health and well-being. So they're approaches where rather than a traditional sort of biomedical model, which is very focused on an individual, what can an individual do, what sort of medicines might you need and so on to take around health or well-being. Um, you look at really building on people's strengths. So Nada was talking about one culture football, but that's something that people come, they have skills already in playing sport, um, and that can be really health promoting for people. They're out in the community, they're building social connections, they're feeling a sense of hope, and strengths-based approaches are very much about developing hope for people um, that can really then facilitate their um, positive mental health and well-being. So um, examples of strengths-based approaches might be participating in sport. They might be the yoga therapies. So when Robin, you spoke to people, what are their needs? They said they're familiar with yoga. It's something that people already have skills in that they're then using to promote their health and well-being in ways they might not have thought of uh, previously. We also see a great emergence of arts-based therapies and music therapies. So again, you may have arrived in Australia with perhaps quite limited English language skills, but you're really great at playing an instrument or you really enjoy just getting your hands messy with paints and crafts and we can really use those things to um, work through people's psychological distress or mental health issues or even physical health issues sometimes in ways that you know they're building upon skills and knowledge that they already have. That's great, thanks Clemmy. that's a good explanation. <coughs> okay, you've now got a chance to ask Anna or the rest of the panel a, a question. So don't be shy, there's one down the front here and two down the front here, so we go one, two. If you'd like to say who you are before you... Yeah, sure, it. I'm Michael Musker, I'm from the South Australian Health and Medical Research Institute. Uh, my area is mental health and well-being. I'm just interested to hear how uh, people who are refugees have experienced the mental health system here in South Australia and maybe how it could be improved. So, Anna, do you, you haven't... Do you have any sort no, of information on that? Of no, of, of the mental health system from, from the research to start with, perhaps, and then I'll... Uh, <laughs> we looked at primary health... Um, primary health care more generally, including mm. the mental health system, and I, I think that that issue of trauma itself making it difficult to navigate through the health system is kind of a, a, a quite noteworthy thing. Things, elements of trauma that can impact on your capacity to attend appointments on time, um, go through the public transport system, be prepared to kind of feel trusting of a health of a health professional. That's certainly been highlighted as, as, a, as a barrier to primary health care more generally, including um, mental health. I mean, the key thing about mental health services, other than um, dedicated ones like STARS, is that accessing prime, private um, health, health providers in, around psychology and um, other mental health providers is, is really um, the cost is a huge factor. Yeah, I think my, my question is more focused on the institutional <laughs> stuff where you have to be admitted to a hospital and oh, okay. you know, that sort of extreme sort of mental yeah, health. Okay. Yeah, okay, so no, I don't have, yeah. but maybe Robin, you were talking about. I don't know. I'll take that. Okay, oh, Dawn. thanks, oh, yes. Dawn. 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 <laughs> um, I was diagnosed with PTSD back in uh, 20, 2014, 2015. Uh, upon my arrival to Australia, two years after my arrival to Australia. Um, at that time, um, I didn't have any access to any medical health services in Australia due to visa restrictions, which means I had to deal with my mental health uh, privately and on my own expenses. Um, at one stage, at one night, um, following a series of events, 
including, as Robin said, nightmares, memories, lack of sleep, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I was completely distressed and lost control. And I went to the police station and I said, lock me in. I'm a complete danger to the society, my family, everyone around me. I've, I still believe that there, there was some part of my brain still functioning and that small cell count of cells took me to the police station. Um, they took me immediately to Flinders Medical Center. In Flinders Medical Center, I've seen all kind of um, good treatment, let's say. Like, um, I spent only one night in Flinders because I couldn't afford it. Late, later on, I received uh, an invoice for 2,500 uh, Australian dollar. So imagine, imagine someone diagnosed with PTSD receiving an invoice for $2,500 a couple of days after being discharged. <coughs> um, following the medical center, I was sent to respite center, and my mental health journey started on that day and ended with STARS and Anglicare. Um, Anglicare eventually stepped in, even though I wasn't entitled for the service. Um, somehow, and I absolutely have no memory of that time, I managed to get access to counseling sessions at start, and I worked my way back. So if you ask me, what if I was someone different, I would say I wouldn't be alive today. So for people who have limitation in their visa and they're accessing the health, and health services, it's quite... Uh, to be honest, I don't know what's the right word to, to use in that situation. It's the it's dead end. That's it. Impossible. Thank you, John, for, for sharing that with us. Robin, and then I'll come back to you. Um, <coughs> the mental health services in South Australia, as we know, are underfunded. Um, and we're, you know, unfortunately, I think the budget today announced another 25% cut to the NGO mental health services as funding is handed over to NDIS, which is putting more and more reliance on the state health system. Um, unfortunately, the main entrance to that is through emergency departments, which is exactly where the government's not wanting everyone to turn up. But if you can imagine you've come from a refugee background, you've experienced a whole lot of trauma, you turn up at a hospital to wait to be seen. The wait's a really long time. And if you can't speak English, actually communicating to that person what your problem is. So sometimes the people who come to our service will say they did present at the hospital, but they left because <coughs> they couldn't get the message across of what they needed to talk about. And even once you're into the system, that not being able to communicate with people about what your issues are or how you're dealing with it, it can be really hard to navigate. If and, you know, people are trying. There was um, the big work on the health plan last year, mental health plan, and we repeatedly talked about the need for interpreters in systems and training and things like that. Um, the challenge is the resourcing. Yeah. And I think it's, it's worth noticing that another country, New Zealand, has just invested in heavily in a, a network of mental health services around the country as part of a budget they're calling a well-being budget. So a very different focus, not bothering about the economy or balancing the budget, but let's make that investment because it's good for the health of people. So it really contrasts, I think, strongly with the policies we're experiencing. Here. Sorry, there's one more thing I want yeah, to Yeah, yeah, sure. The right, other thing know. it really struggles with is um, the difference in visas. So people who are asylum seekers, for example, um, the mental health system really struggles to work with people that um, because there's chronic suicidality. And admitting somebody to hospital for a few days or a week, it doesn't take away any of the things that are underlying or causing that. Um, and, you know, we work with quite a few people who are at that really high level of having suicidal thoughts and how do you maintain that hope and keep going on. But our system isn't designed necessarily to support people who another part of our system is inflicting the, the pain and the challenges and the barriers for. And it's almost something that's, you know, it's hard for people to take control over lots of areas of their life when there is so little that's within their control. So it's really about finding those little things that I mean, hanging on to hope. Um, and often it is connection to family, whether it's here or overseas or things like that, but it's a difficult yeah. journey. Thanks, Robin. And Aretha? I would see psychologists and I would see counsellors and I even started seeing a psychiatrist. And then what they did was they just put me in um, the a child and adolescent, uh, I forgot what it's called, but it, it's... Um. Camps, yeah, yeah and, and I was just sort of basically locked up for a week in the hospital because I was a 
you know, I was potentially going to harm myself. And the funny thing was, it was literally one of the worst weeks of my life because I was just with a bunch of people and we were all struggling. And there was this one moment, one day where me and another girl that was also there for anxiety reasons, we were connecting and I went into her room and we were literally, she was like, hey, you have really nice long hair. Let me braid your hair. And she started braiding my hair. And then a psychiatrist, yes, a nurse came storming in and she was like, you're not supposed to be in each other's rooms. And she just told us off and we all just, and I was like, that was my only good experience the entire week that I was here and they ruined it. So, I mean, there's a lot of problems in our mental health system. And unfortunately, it's also not diverse enough. A lot of the psychologists that we have, a lot of the counselors that we have don't really have the kind of, I guess, sometimes necessary knowledge to be able to work with individuals that come from very different backgrounds that have very different needs and very different struggles so and like I mean my parents my mom and dad have tried to go to counseling but it just does them no good because a they have to rely on an interpreter and half the time the interpreters just don't know what they're doing they're not very good at it um, and then there's trust issues because it's going between multiple people and then the interpreter is usually somebody from within your community and so you're like no this person is going to go and it's going to spread everywhere and everyone's going to find out that I'm having these problems so yeah, mental health is a big, big problem. Okay, well, thank you again for telling us of that experience. <coughs> okay, another question down, down the I think it's just on. Uh, hello, my name's Tracy. Um, we've acquired fam we've acquired family from Cameroon and Rwanda, and they're doing well <laughs> now. They arrived as refugees. Um, a lot of the Rwandan families we know, there's quite a bit of fathers in the family who aren't doing so well, alcohol, not great husbands. And it just seems very similar to Vietnam vets um, of a different generation. And now there's the young lads who are growing up looking to be fathers and husbands and not wanting to repeat what they've not, they don't want to be the fathers and husbands they've grown up with. So they're having to learn from scratch. And I just wondered, is there any spare resources or people? Is anyone looking at that sort of second wave of, like the Vietnam vets, that, you know, their families struggled quietly at home? Okay. So, Robin or Clem, Clem, <coughs> This sounds like too technical for the services that we offer, but I think the services that we have can be a key and a gateway for what you're looking for um we would have Actually, um, round world football is the second religion first religion and the sold <laughs> bring him along <laughs> i'm glad now um i'm no i think that's this is one of the things and i'm just um going back with the memory uh some little experiences with some of the young boys that we have been working with um have um come out of houses that it's been domestic violence and has been this and that. And we received phone calls after midnight. Hey, listen, I just left the house. I don't know where to go. And this, just meet me where you are, McDonald's West Terrace. Coming all the way up from wherever I live, I have to do something. Started on the phone calling all of these services and weekend mental health use services and stuff, whatever I could. But I just had to see this person, you know what I mean, like for, for quite some This is totally not my job, but this I built trust with these people that they could call me after midnight. And I just picked up the phone because they wouldn't be calling me at this time. And this is what it is. And w we could get past that, but there's a lot of this. And as for us, um, sport and inclusion, being in a healthy environment, and it's not just the physical health side of it, because I would hear... An African lad calling another African lad nigger, which is not a problem between them. I will tell them both off. I'm African too. I'm Egyptian. I'm not, maybe I'm not black enough, but I don't want to hear this word on my court. Everybody got to behave. Everybody got to respect one another. Because if you two calling yourselves like this and then comes another lad from Syria or Afghanistan and thinking it's okay and then they just call you nigger and then you punch him in the face and then it's a different story now. Like... Uh, and I'm not um, shy to tell the boys, um, mainly the boys, like, in their faces like this, listen, I'm no different to you, and I'm telling you here, one, two, three, these are the rules. And they always, they always adhere because it's 
a healthy environment, everybody is respected. This could be a good gateway for them. Please invite them through and we'll see what we can do. Thank you. Else want to respond to that question? Oh, I, I just, I guess, just very briefly from a research perspective, um, I think there is definitely the intergenerational issues and the sort of second generation or the younger generation coming coming through. That there are definitely some tensions there and and some challenges. And I think you know Arif has really talked about that really eloquently around some of the issues. I think we don't do a great job necessarily around parenting and expectations. There's you know things like um, you know different parenting styles that are really frowned upon in Australia, but we don't necessarily replace it with something else. We say you can't do this, but not so much what you can do or what might be positive. And I think that, um, you know, it is really important for us to to look not just necessarily at new arrivals, but also people who came as children and the way they've been growing up in Australia and how to support their needs as well. Sure, go ahead. I'm looking for the next question. Thank you. It's all the settlement services basically aim to um, create an independent um, person in the new community. Now, it's up to that person to decide if they want to be with their family or they want to be if they want to live by themselves as long as they legally can. But as a settlement coach in, in our program, if someone approached me and he said or she said, I want to leave my parents' house because I don't like the way they're living. It's my duty to provide that service. So from a service point of view, the settlement uh, services are framed around independence. And that's, I think that's a key factor in responding to your, to your question. So if, if, if that person is independent, then they can make decisions, which is the other pillar of the settlement services. So independence, decision making and well-being. Um, it's completely up to that person to decide if they want to disconnect, stay connect, or maintain um, some sort of relationship. Mm, okay. Any other questions? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, Mine is not a, a question, it's more of a comment. My name is Grace. I just wanted to add on to the strengths-based approach that you talked about. Um, what I do, what we do in our community, we found that community events are very, very important, and you know that cohesion. Can you tell us what your community is? That's Kenya, Kenya Kenyan community. Kenyan community. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's quite cohesive in terms of um, social events. We do a lot in terms of getting together, whether uh, even if it's someone's birthday and all that. What has really helped us a lot is uh, social media in terms of a WhatsApp group. So we try, our community leaders try to get new people coming in from Kenya in, into a WhatsApp group. We've got a group in the north and another one in the south with, with numerous people. So it's really up to the individual whether they want to socially isolate themselves or get in because you can't force somebody. But those that get in there really get involved and really become uh, like wired into the community and that helps a lot because on those uh, social media groups, um, where I come from, people are quite religious as well. And we found that religion is one very big thing that has helped us survive in the community. So I just thought maybe those are the two issues I could Great. add on to that. Thank you very much. Yeah. OK. Uh, oh, all right. Yeah, I was going to go. Uh, I, I guess mine's, I mean, it's not, sorry. Just it's not so, so much. I'm saying who, oh. who you are, just for the. OK, sorry. Um, I'm Sandra <laughs> Agega from Flinders Uni. Great. Um, and I was thinking very much about, and I, I'm not quite sure whether this is a question for you, or it's more just like a, a reflection, that you were talking about that role of home and the security and the importance of that and the, the I guess, the way that it feeds into hope. And I was thinking about the refugees on Manus and Nauru and the appalling situation that they're in <coughs> and how they're now claiming that they have a complete lack of hope. And recently I read that after the federal election, um, there's been 12 more suicide attempts and one man has self-emulated, um, which is horrendous, you know, that they're at that point where mm. death is better than what they've got. And, you know, the problems that you, you know, face and the refugees that face here, I think, 
these people are going to be so damaged, you know, that this has been, this is six years now mm. and it's going on. There doesn't seem to be any kind of end to it. If they ever do get off, they're going to have children and, again, they're going to be very hard for them to settle in any kind of community as healthy, productive individuals. And I'm not sure if there's anything we can do to, you know, about that situation either. Right. But. That's a big issue. And I, I mean, uh, and thanks for your comment. Um, I think, I think what I, think I Robin oh, was sorry, Robin. No, I was just going to say that, I mean, certainly the research shows that there are those long-term damages. So people who have previously been in, like in other rounds of detention, we haven't had, you know, the, the length and the, the nature of the t detention on Manus before, but previous periods in detention have certainly had knock-on effects for people and I mean the people living on temporary visas here it's another version of I mean I know John wants to um, jump in about the notion of hope but yeah. it is it is a really crucial part of of um, well-being and like you said you've identified exactly that you start you're not starting from a from dot zero when you when you settle when you've been through those experiences but Robin might have some um, you're absolutely right in terms of the hopelessness there. Um, it's been a few years since I've visited either Manus or Nauru, but even then, hope was very, very low for people. Um, a lot of the people there had experienced torture and trauma before they arrived. Um, and then one of the things that we all know about trauma is the time when it has the biggest effect on you is those times when you're exhausted and those times all those times when you think you've finally reached safety and it disappears. So for a lot of those people, when they reached Australia, it was that sense of a really long, dangerous journey and now I'm here and I'm finally safe. And then that disappeared and they got sent to some islands where they had no control over pretty much anything. And, you know, living in a very intense security environment where very basic decisions about your life from day to day are taken away, what you eat, when you eat, where you go, all of that. Um, and people have lived with that for six years or so. And even now that the centres are open and people have the freedom to move around and things, what people will say is that freedom's not there in my mind. Um, and what, what can we do? I guess as a population what we need to do is to put pressure on the government to come up with a solution that it's not OK to put people on islands like that for long periods of time. The millions and millions and millions of dollars that we've spent on a very small number of people, really, um, that's led to really bad health determinants compared to what we could have done with that same amount of money to help huge numbers of people. Um, but we've created a really big problem and it's not OK to say there's no solution and people just have to sit there for years and years. We have to find a solution. New Zealand's offered to take 150 people a year. If we'd accepted that six years ago, there would be no one left on Manus or Nauru. Um, if we're not going to accept that, the onus is on the government to find something else for people. And the only thing that's going to make that change is the pressure from the general population because at the moment they think it's a vote winner to keep doing this and we have to convince them that that's not OK, that there has to be a more durable solution and more humane solution. Thanks, Robin. John, do you want to... Yeah, sure, thing. go ahead. Um, my experience is a bit... Um, not relevant to the detention center, but I can I can connect to the hope concept. And hope, f from my perspective, is a very broad word. And from my journey, I try to break down what do we mean by hope. We at Anglicare SA run a, um, a cultural awareness training program where we just tell people, sit and speak to people about people from different background from the cult community, from overseas, refugees. And, and I share my story in that, in that training. I've been doing this for the past four years. One of the hardest questions I've ever faced from the audience was, how do you motivate someone who lost everything? And the answer is simple. You create hope. But the problem is hope is a broad, is a broad word. If you break it down, I broke it down to purpose. You need to find a purpose to stay alive, you need to be welcomed, you need to feel needed, and you, f you need to be um, accepted by the community. If, if these things are not uh, there, there is no hope. Job, employment will not give you hope. 
will give you means to stay alive, to survive. But if you felt welcome, if you felt accepted, if you felt needed, if you felt that you have a purpose, then you can start to contribute back to the community. And this, these four pillars, what brought me back from PTSD, normal life, to being a settlement coach, to being someone who's helping people to settle in the community. So hope is, is it, by itself, it means nothing. But if we break it down to more tangible, meaningful terms, this is where we can see results from um, on the ground. Great, Thank thanks. You. I just want to ask Arifa, because I know that you've been involved in a leadership program recently, and you know that's enabled you to be able to be more of a voice for your community. Do you want to talk about the importance of that voice and, and that kind of leadership? Because it sounds to me like that might have been about generating hope too. Sure. So, um, as I said, for a lot of us, isolation is a big, big issue. And for six years that I was in that country town, I was just completely lost. And then I took a gap year. I went to some stuff to do some uh, leadership stuff. And then I came across somebody at the time who was just working on building this organization. So it was Kate and it was Brad and the two of them were trying to start a website and the website was called Welcome to Australia. So and she's, Brad Chilcott, is it? Yes. And she said, hey, would you like to write your story and I want to put your story up on our website. And for the first time in about six years, someone was actually interested in my story. Mm. And because all the time that I was in school, I was the kid that nobody cared about. And I was always that, I, you know, you'd get international students and they would get so much attention. And I was like, but I'm different and I'm exotic. Why isn't anybody else giving me any attention? So for the first time, someone was actually interested in my story. And that after I made that connection and after I came to Adelaide and I started connecting with people similar to Brad and I started sharing my story, I just changed as a person. I started developing networks and I started becoming friends with people. And I was like, hey, you know what? There's value to my life and there's value to who I am as a person. And so I've kind of always been connected with Welcome to Australia and now becoming Welcoming Australia. And so then now that they just started the Intercultural Futures Program, it's quite... <coughs> Excuse me. It's quite interesting in that they've tried to bring refugee um, youth from very different communities together and they're kind of, they put us in a room and they give us certain skills and they're like, go figure, figure out how you can. So what skills do they give you? So for example, a lot of us that want to be in leadership positions within our own community, for me personally, I hate public speaking. And I was like, I really dislike it, but I feel like my voice is important and I need to be able to tell my story and I need to be able to speak for my community and I need to be able to do that effectively. Well, I think it must have been very good training to do that tonight. So. I, I think so. <laughs> and so, and I would push it, I would avoid it. And even throughout my undergrad degree, I did all of my presentations to my teacher alone. I would never present to the whole class. I just hated it. But I was like, at some point, I need to push myself. And so when I found myself, and the beauty of this program was that everybody was very, although we were very different in our vulnerability, we were very, very similar. We all were struggling with very similar things at home, you know, because I, usually my anxiety just mm. goes up when I'm around my peers that I've literally been born in Australia and grew up in Australia because I there's some sort of a priority I, I guess inferiority complex that I have when it comes to people that are born in Australia but then when I was suddenly around people who had very similar journeys to me and were all like hey I I want to learn how to speak publicly and so we would they would give us the workshop and then they would create some sort of an in what they'd ask you to organize an event where you were then kind of forced to practice, practice that skill. And so we did that for about a whole year. And through that, I think the beautiful thing that's really special to me and to a lot of the participants is that we've been able to now connect with other young people from other refugee communities. And we're learning from each other how we're dealing with a lot of the settlement issues that we have in our own individual communities and how we can then borrow those ideas. Okay. Because you find so many things. I mean, you, so, so, so often you think that you're alone in your struggles. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then somebody else is like, no, I deal with the exact same thing in my community. And I go, okay, what have you tried to do to fix it? And then they'll give you 
their suggestions. And I'm like, oh, you know what? I'll try that with mine. And so the, the idea of this whole thing is that we can continue to keep those networks. And then now they have a second generation of young people that are going to come. And then some of us are going to go back as mentors. And then the, so there's going to be this wide network of young people from different communities learning from each and other. what did you say the name of the program was? The inter Intercultural Future. Yeah. But I think they're changing that now to Welcoming Futures. That sounds better, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah welcome in the future. Okay, we've got time for another couple of questions. Is there, is there, if not, I've got some more, but it would be nice to hear from people in the audience. No, we've got... Okay, well, I'd, I'd perhaps ask um, Robin, that what are some of the ways that, in your therapeutic strategies at SARS, how do you... You know, we've heard about some of the huge trauma that people are facing. You know, they've been through war, they've been through conflict, they've been through torture. How do you, how do you, how do you go about tackling some of those issues in your service? I mean, it just seems an immense problem. Well, the way that we go about it is very different depending on each person. We don't have a set model or formula that is applied to everybody. It's very much based on getting to know that person. Um, but everybody that comes here is actually, they're a survivor, they're not a victim that there are so many people that have really bad experiences before they get here and to actually survive that journey and to get here takes strengths. It takes resilience. And people, there will be things from people's past that have helped them to get through that that they can apply in a different way here to help them get through the new things. There will be things that were really important in somebody's life that in those darkest times, instead of giving up, that actually caused them to keep going and reconnecting with that. It may not be the same thing here that you do, but the underlying values, the underlying really important things, there's ways to connect that here and to re-envision that. So it's a journey. It's um, often listening to people's stories and what might at first come out as a story of terrible things that happened to me. There's always another story there of survival, of strength, of resilience, of hope. And so it's tapping into all of those things and helping people to start to rebuild that here and connect and have some positive experiences and form new connections so that people aren't alone. Okay, well, thank you. Now, just to finish off, I'm going to ask you all to imagine something and just give me each a short answer. And that's that there's a new government in Australia, so it's probably three years, and they've appointed a minister <coughs> of refugee resettlement. They've made it a big national issue. They've established a ministry. And I just want you to think about what would be the one thing you'd want that minister to do? What would be the first thing you'd want them to do if they were Minister of Refugee Resettlement? I don't mind what order, but, you know, whoever's happy to go first. Um, okay. I think I know what this is going to be. <laughs> I just don't want him to be Tony Abbott. To begin with. <laughs> it could be a she. <laughs> um, I would like for them to be... Um, a minister with a lived experience of being a refugee or an okay. asylum seeker or, or, or whatever you want to name it, but he can really see through these bodies and thoughts and, and people that he sees around them, so, or she. Um, they can actually understand and yeah. reflect. Okay, so they should have relevant experience. That, that's a great one. Who, 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 anyone else got some <coughs> advice for this new minister? I'd say invest in people when they first arrive. Invest in really good services because, I mean, look at my panellists here. <laughs> um, there's lots that you don't know about each of them. But what we see is there's people who've arrived and who've had terrible experiences, but what they contribute back to our society is amazing. Um, and, you know... If you could hear the richness of some of their stories or the other stories that we, we have, have what you what you invest, there's a lot more. No, I'm sure. <laughs> um, what you invest, the, our society gets back so much more in the future. So if it's you... a bit a bit like in terms of early childhood education. There's been a study that said for every dollar you invest, you get eight dollars back. So you're kind of saying we could do exactly the same with refugees. And you get a lot more. And back. you get a lot more. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Who, who's next? Can I, I can next? Yeah. I mean, I think I would I would say um, to really think outside the square. So I absolutely agree with Robin to invest in services, but to really think outside the square of what they could be. Um, often services, you know, there's, there's funding restrictions like we've talked about, and they can be very streamlined. But I think it would be great to see this, you know, really generous funding. 
funding of diverse services that do build on people's strengths so that we do have funding into arts and sport and, you know, all of those things as well as housing and education, which of course are also critically important, um, but just a real diversity of services. So perhaps wrapping up a Medicare card and giving everybody <laughs> a Medicare card as well? Yeah, okay. Um, I would say to transfer us as a service provider from being a provider a settlement service provider to be a settlement hubs. Okay. Mm. I'm, I'm just reflecting on, on a concept in the social innovation <coughs> principle. Mm. We're facing a problem in our society, which is the settlement of the refugees, and we can't solve it by, it's, it's a weak problem, it's a complex problem, yeah, yeah. and we can't solve it with a simple solutions. Like we can't address one area of the settlement and then provide funding to each one of them and then coordinate through case workers and case management and then expect results. We need to be a host for these people. We need to host them. We need to provide settlement advice, coaching, mentoring. We need to create hope. We need to find them purpose. We need to have, make them feel welcomed, have some sort of belonging, develop some belonging feelings and then provide ongoing support. Forget about timeframes. Forget about five years of settlement. Forget about the definition of the settlement and the settlement framework. This is a problem that has more than a hundred different definitions. Yeah. And you can't simply uh, write a blueprint called the Australian Settlement Framework and ask three layers of government mm. to design services and stuff. We need to transform the way we deliver the service from being a service provider be a settlement hubs. Fantastic. And I loved your sense of being hosts, being good hosts. Host. And I'm thinking what we do at the moment, we've taken people who have come we to Australia, it. we've locked them in a little room in the house and just thrown away the keys. So, at yeah. the moment, we call them clients. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they're not clients. Yeah. You need to treat them like Tracy. She's a family. She's a family for these people. We need to act like a family for these people. Mm -hmm. Even if we are a service provider, we need to think of them as a family members. Yeah. And then we can design whatever. You want to call it service? Mm. You want to call it workshop? I'll call it catch-up. Mm. Meeting, yeah. um, casual meeting. Then we can talk about um, going to the gym. Um, how about membership? How about swimming pool? How about a barbecue outside? I know we're doing this right now, but we're doing it as a service, mm. as a mm. client service provider relationship. We need to be a family for these people. Otherwise, we're going to still be dealing with a complex problem in, with a very simple Absolutely. and shadow solutions, which in return is going to create a response from these people, utilizing their strengths and strategies, and they're going to respond to these strategies, to these solutions. They're going to create more problems. Government going to create more responses and yeah. vice versa. Yeah. Okay, well, that sounds like good advice. Arifa. I guess just adding on to that, um, exercise empathy, because that's something that we currently lack. Mm -hmm. I think we often, in, in all, all the conversation and debate around refugees, we forget that they're people. And when it comes to policies, when it comes to actually processing stuff, we become just numbers on pieces of paper. And I've been at the receiving end of that for over a decade, and it's like, they just see you as nothing more than a piece of paper that they need to get rid of. And so that has consequences for everybody. Mm, okay, yeah. thanks for that. And Anna, <coughs> what would you tell this minister if you've got oh, I, a briefing to do? Well, certainly the baseline is to close the detention centres and, and yeah. deal with visa issues. But if we've dealt with that and we're actually taking a more holistic view forward, I think I really go back to what Nader says about um, people with lived experience. And I think about the Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Service movement and mm. how having people with lived experience um, running services and determining um, priorities is so crucial. And if you, you know, listening here to the panel tonight, hearing lived experience and how that informs and could, inf mm. could inform the process forward is, is incredibly okay. powerful. Okay. Well, thank you. And, and really, from Flinders University, particularly to the external people, thank you so much. And, and thank you for sharing your lived experience too, because I think you're very brave. And to think that you didn't think you were good at public speaking. You've done so well, but for all of you, you've done brilliantly. So please join me in thanking the panel.